start this conversation with Senator Merkley. Good afternoon. Welcome to the City Club's Friday Forum. I am Nikenge Harmon Johnson. For f nearly five years now, it's been my honor to be the president and CEO of the Urban League of Portland. <clears throat> I'm delighted to be with all of you here today at the EcoTrust uh, building in Northwest Portland. In just a few minutes, I will introduce uh, our guests. Um, but first, I want to note that there are thousands of people joining us uh, online, on radio, and on TV, in addition to you wonderful people who have braved the weather uh, and perhaps uh, the fear of some illnesses that are uh, spreading uh, to join us here in person today. Uh, live viewers are watching on KGW's website, Facebook feed, and news app, and our radio audience is listening via X-Ray FM's uh, stations, 107.1 FM and 91.1 FM. TV viewers will also watch today's program on community media television. We are incredibly grateful for the support of our media partners in bringing City Club's uh, forums to our community. We know it's important for so many more people who can actually be in the room today to have the opportunity to hear from today's guest. They will also have the opportunity to ask questions via Twitter, so that's exciting. Uh, in addition to City Club's valued media partners, our sponsors, volunteers, and staff enable us to put on uh, one of Oregon's best yeah. civic programs. I think you'll see a slide uh, on either side uh, that shows some of today's sponsors. A special thank you goes to EcoTrust for working with us to bring Friday Forum to this space. For me, I've been on the Friday Forum stage before, but it's the very first time that I've been in this space, and I love it. I'm very glad to be back here, so congratulations, Julia. Thank you, Juan. Uh, EcoTrust believes in the power of convening people around great ideas. The organization operates two historically rooted, forward-thinking Portland gathering spaces, the Red on Salmon Street on the east side, and this building, the Natural Capital Center. When you host an event in one of these buildings, your dollars go to support their work to create environmental well-being, economic opportunity, and social equity in this place that we all call home. Thank you also to Elephants for providing wonderful food, Please join me in showing our appreciation to everyone who's made today's event possible. Uh, the City Club would also like to take a moment to remind everyone, everyone, to fill out Oregon Census 2020. You count, so please make that count. I always say that Oregon is a teeny tiny state. Uh, we're wedged in between Washington State and California, so we need each and every one of us to raise our hand to sign up to um, to make sure that we count, otherwise we could be sort of washed away. Um, that's what I say, that's not what the other people say. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, moving on to the heart of our program. Uh, it's been a busy year in Washington, D.C., a little bit, and it's only March, uh, but it's been a very busy year for Senator Jeff Merkley because I think that sometimes he does not sleep. Um, he works very hard on so many issues for us, uh, from publicly pressuring uh, Trump on global humanitarian rights, to later voting to impeach, So working, forward, uh, working toward creating um, a reasonable um, and regulated cannabis banking system, uh, demanding action on gun safety and legislation, launching an investigation, <laughs> uh, launching an investigation into reports that Credit Suisse engaged in retaliatory espionage against climate protesters, imagine. Uh, and most recently, launching a coronavirus research page for Oregonians. Senator Merkley has represented the people of Oregon through a breadth of work. Uh, now, I'm glad to welcome him to this stage. Thank you so much, Senator. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be with you. So as we get started, folks, uh, I'm going to have the opportunity to ask Senator some questions. Um, and as you listen in, please do remember that you'll have the opportunity later in the, in the, uh, in the session um, to ask questions yourselves. There's a microphone on the side, cards will be passed around, and then those of you watching from home or from work can use social media to send your questions in. And I promise to take at least um, one or two from uh, folks who are out there in the social media world. Uh, Senator, you know, I'm delighted to be here with you today um, because I know your work and have the opportunity to work with you and your team pretty regularly. 
um, in my role as the president of the Urban League of Portland. As I'm moving around in the community, and I attend town halls both locally and, and those that are uh, congressional dele delegation host, I very often hear people at the, at the congressional events talking about the cost of drugs and the cost of, uh, of health care. When I'm at locally hosted or events from, with local officials, and even for that matter, the Urban League's own events, we hear people talking about the cost of housing and how unaffordable it is, how difficult it is. And it's, it's interesting to me to see what a stark sort of divide is. I almost never hear people on the local level talking about the cost of healthcare and the cost of drugs. But I think that's because housing is your everyday workaday issue. And if you can't afford a home, healthcare may be your next most important issue, but if you don't have a roof over your head, it's first on your list. That's what I suspect. In any case, I want to talk to you about both of those things, and then we'll explore some other issues, too. Okay. Okay, um, will you take a minute to talk with us about what you're doing uh, related to housing? I know that there are many issues on your plate, and people are talking to you about it all the time. Uh, but what do you see as the federal government's role um, to help make housing more affordable here in Oregon and in other states across the country? Uh, thanks so much, Nankenge. And thank you for the invitation from the City Club to uh, join you all. How many folks here would consider uh, uh, housing as one of their top two priorities? Uh, that's pretty much everybody in the room. Uh, it is a very big deal, and, I, and the context I bring to this is that when I'm the son of a mechanic, and my dad and mother bought a home on the very, it was outside of Portland, it's now been incorporated into Portland. The cost in that blue collar David Douglas community uh, was about twice a mechanic's annual wages. And now a house in that community is about five times a mechanic's annual wages, which puts home ownership out of reach for most people. Or I think about back when I came home to Oregon in the early 90s and uh, worked for Habitat for Humanity. And every time we were able to stabilize a family uh, through uh, home ownership, um, it was a dramatic transformation in the, in the family's lives. So uh, a decent, and the Habitat had a slogan that kind of is one I've adopted for thinking about that, which was uh, a decent home and a decent community for every family in need. And that should be achievable in our, in our nation. At the federal level, I'm really focused on the additional resources that the federal government can bring to, to bear. If we think about the fact that we're spending uh, $45 billion a year in Afghanistan, what would happen if we weren't spending a dime in Afghanistan, we spent $45 billion more on affordable housing here in the United States of America? In other words, we have resources to invest more and to invest more in every aspect, to invest more in affordable uh, rentals through our, our Section 8 vouchers, both project-based and uh, attached to a, a person so that they can, can move throughout the community, uh, down payments, assistance on, on homes, uh, vouch vouchers, which assist uh, veterans. We've cut the, the homeless rate for veterans in half in Oregon primarily through VASH vouchers, which is a, a, a nice piece of progress on one piece of the puzzle. But so to summarize this, n two weeks from now, I'm going to uh, introduce a bill called the Affordable Home Act. Uh, and it's about making a massive uh, additional investment of, of, of a significant amount in the range of $45 billion a year here in America. Senator, that's exciting. So for someone like me who runs a social profit organization, uh, and for those of you who don't know, the Urban League of Portland uh, is one of the oldest civil rights and social justice organizations in the Pacific Northwest. And we focus on housing uh, and health, education and jobs, um, particularly for African Americans, but also for others in Oregon and Southwest Washington. Um, so the issue of housing is a huge one for us. Four and a half years ago, we didn't have a housing program. Uh, now we have one that tops uh, more than $3 million a year, and we still have waiting lists for people who need our help that we can't get to. Um, so when you talk about um, the importance of bringing that legislation forward, I'm very excited about it because there's lots being done on the local level, on the regional level. There's some being done on the statewide level. Uh, but we know the federal government has got to get involved. And frankly, it's because the federal government has caused, or at least fostered, a lot of the problems that we're seeing on a local level. Um, federal dollars can't be spent to build public housing anymore, which means that almost all the housing that built in our communities has a profit motive, right? Somebody has to make a lot of money off of it. It's not about just getting people housed. Uh, redlining and gentrification that's happened. 
was fostered because of federal government incentives to displace people from their neighborhoods um, to supposedly make them better than they were before, but it's led to vast changes for people who um, aren't able to be invested, aren't able to be rooted, um, and it's, uh, in, for many people, has devastated them, their families uh, and the communities that they've enjoyed for a long time. So I'm excited to hear that you're doing this work. I'm really interested, though, to know, as you're talking to your colleagues, do they see what you see? So when you're home in Oregon, I know that you go over to the Port of Morro and you see that workforce housing is an issue. I know you visit Bend and you see that housing and homelessness is an issue. You're in Salem and you see that even in, in, in my hometown, in Salem, housing is unaffordable compared to what it used to be even four years ago. But do your colleagues in the U.S. Senate um, understand that? Are they feeling the same kind of heat from their constituents when they go back home? Well, not all of them. <laughs> No, I think it should be a requirement for every member of Congress to do a whole lot of town halls, because then they would see these real issues that families are struggling with. Uh, we do have a fair number of members of the Senate and House who live in gated communities. They're surrounded by people who are at the upper 10 percent of America. Uh, and uh, that's, why, that's why Senator Wyden established the practice I've, I followed of being, going to every county every year and holding an open town hall in order to see the real issues. And I can guarantee you that housing comes up at every single town hall, no matter where I am uh, in, in our state. And you mentioned rural housing. Uh, the challenge for many small towns is you can't get someone to build housing in advance of people buying it and spec housing. And then when a company is willing to come to town, they go, well, but there's no housing to employ people. So they look for an, a larger community or a different community. So it's, 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 a, it's a big deal uh, everywhere. But one piece that I did want, as you noted, these past um, pressures um, and injustice that we've had, including uh, redlining, which was a powerful, powerful tool for basically destroying the opportunity of home ownership in many of our minority communities. And uh, home ownership is the major driver of middle class wealth in America. So you essentially took away middle class wealth from neighborhood after neighborhood after neighborhood through, through redlining. Uh, but so a portion of my bill uh, is called restorative housing justice and it is designed to give preference to folks who are past victims of discriminatory practices to be at the front of the line if you will in terms of number of the housing grant or loan programs. Senator, I applaud you for that, and I thank you for saying so, because it's important that when specific harms were done, that we remediate them through specific action, right? Um, let's shift a little bit and talk about um, health, health care and the cost of health care. But let's start off with talking about what's on sort of everyone's mind, what's in the headlines, uh, talking about the coronavirus. Uh, I know that on um, this week, uh, during the all-staff meeting at the Urban League, we took some time on our agenda to talk about uh, what's true, what's not, to dispel some myths and some rumors, and to talk about just sort of good, basic, standard practices that can help keep us all safe. The things that we should be doing anyway, by the way, to avoid the common cold and the regular old flu, by the way. Um, like washing our hands and what that means with soap and water and uh, how to greet people and just all the, you know, the way that we clean the spaces that we share. Um, so this is sort of a good opportunity for us to behave the way we were taught in kindergarten um, and to really follow those rules. But um, on, a, on a deeper and broader level, I know that you um, have been trying to educate folks and make sure that we have the resources they need. They need. Um, will you talk a little bit about that? Before we came up here, we were practicing our elbow bump and our boot bump. We'll do it before we leave the stage, I promise. <laughs> Uh, so last weekend I was immersed in contacting the education community because of the case we had in, in Lake Oswego and the, uh, the health community here and the labor community uh, to create maximum contacts on how Oregon is, is responding. And then simultaneously I was working on the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, portion of the national bill. We completed our work on Saturday. I'd hoped we'd be able to vote on Monday on the entire bill, but it took until uh, yesterday, Thursday, for it to get from the House to the, to the, to the Senate. That will inject about $8.3 billion into the national discussion on every aspect of, of this challenge of taking on coronavirus. Uh, that includes um, protective clothing, and that includes masks, and that includes uh, drug supplies, and it includes work on a vaccine, and so forth, all kinds of, of uh, uh, aspects. And having the FDA gears lubricated to really make sure that every action that requires some kind of step in decision-making 
com is immediately uh, acted on, not, not, not delayed. But the question that so many people ask is, how serious is this? How big a deal uh, is this corona? How worried should we be? Yeah. And uh, so um, uh, just I asked that yesterday at a briefing uh, by uh, Secretary Azar and his health care experts from the federal government. And here's what they said. Uh, they said, we don't know uh, how contagious this is going to be. Here in, Na in the United States, uh, we had over five days a six-fold increase in identified cases. If you do a little bit of math, every five days, six-fold increase, there'd be over 100,000 cases by the end of this month. And so I asked, is that what we're anticipating? They said, we're modeling, and we'll have more to say after we learn more, because they're not, they're not sure. But the point is, it's fairly, con it's fairly contagious. Let's put it that way. And then I asked, so, and what should people understand about the risk, the mortality? For example, we have flu, which comes every year, and it kills, in the years since the year 2010, between 14,000 and 65,000 Americans. That's a lot of damage. Is it equal to the flu, or is it more lethal than the flu? And uh, we had two experts stand up and give very different answers. <laughs> so uh, there you go. One expert said it's between 2 to 3 percent compared to 0.1 percent for the flu. That means 20 to 30 times more lethal. And the next expert said, no, no, hold on, that's not right. Our best estimate is between 0.1, equivalent to the flu, and 1 percent, uh, which would be 10 times. So in some ways, it's v think of it as the risk of a very bad flu season. I think that's a fair way to think about this. And, and because we know a lot about mm -hmm. transmission of coronaviruses and that it comes primarily uh, through touch, uh, it does mean, therefore, uh, hand washing, uh, hand sanitizer. If you're holding on to a handrail or touching lots of things in a public place, then think, I'm not going to put my hands to my face because that's where the transmission occurs. Uh, I, I don't really love elbow bumping. I like to shake hands. Um, it's personal, it's connected, it's real, but it is smart for us to recognize that hands are a major source of, of spread, so therefore I'm trying to model everywhere I go uh, elbow bumping or boot bumping, as you suggested. Mm -hmm. And uh, so these, these are very practical. Washing your hands, uh, add that to this uh, formulation. These things greatly reduce the risk. In terms of who's at risk, young people have very low risk. Uh, in, in China, they've had virtually no one seriously ill under 15 or, or who has died. Um, the, um, maybe it ill, but hasn't died. But young people who have special health care problems re related to their lungs and their immune system, then they're very much at risk. Mostly older people, mid-60s up, who have weak immune systems or other lung conditions, they are, they are most at risk. So uh, it's, in that way, it's very similar to the, to the flu. Thank you for talking about that. I think it's, uh, it's on everyone's mind and it's, and it's really important. Yeah, and I, don't, I think we really shouldn't think that we have to stop all of our activities uh, as a society. If you're following those basic practices, then you're pretty much in a very, you're in a pretty safe zone, I'll put it that way. You're not in a completely safe zone, just like we're not completely safe from flu, but we're pretty safe. Just a quick question. Has anyone here had a conference or, or meeting canceled already because of fears about coronavirus? Yeah. It's going to have a big impact on our economy. Uh, as you know, the flights, uh, flights, I mean, that's, that's where I really feel it. <laughs> I've been on these packed airplanes uh, as squished in back there, six, six abreast, and as soon as somebody starts coughing, everyone looks around like, oh, no. <laughs> and I happen to have one of those, uh, I have allergies, and my allergy manifests as coughing, right? I don't sneeze, I don't get runny eyes, but I, <laughs> so I don't know where I'm going to be this spring, but you might not see me for a while. Um, so before we go on, I want to do a broadcast uh, sort of reminder here uh, for our radio audience. Uh, this is the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum coming to you from the EcoTrust Building in Northwest Portland. I am Nikin Gay Harmon Johnson, President and CEO of the Urban League of Portland, and with me is our United States Senator, Jeff Merkley. Uh, Senator, so as you know, uh, the Urban League runs a senior activity center and a senior services program. In fact, we have the only African-American serving program in the, uh, in the state. 
I mean, one of the few in the country, oddly enough, um, I've come to learn, and where we focus on the needs of African American elders. While our program is open to all, um, that, that's our focus. And you've certainly been to our activity center before, you met with some of our clients, uh, they come to your town halls. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, the cost of uh, drug prices, because they um, fall into a group for who's that, that's especially important, um, but as well as for other vulnerable populations, people who have um, uh, long-term sort of health and healthcare needs. Can, will you talk to us just about what you're doing uh, on the front of making drugs more affordable for Oregonians? Well, I'm going to ask you all to uh, vote the same way I ask in, in town halls, because there's three basic approaches to dropping the cost of, of drugs. Uh, and the first is to be able to re-import drugs from approved, inspected, checked out, vetted Canadian pharmacies. How many would support that? Okay. Uh, uh, how, many, how many people would be opposed? And so for our uh, radio audience, uh, that's uh, about 95% on one side and 5% on the other. Okay, a second approach uh, is to say that Medicare can negotiate the price of drugs. Okay. A lot of hands up for support. How many, how many opposed to that? Not too many hands up. I don't see any hands up. Um, uh, the third is to do a reference bill, and what a reference bill says is, oh, dear drug company, you cannot charge Americans more than you charge the median price of how you sell it in Canada, Australia, Japan, and the major European countries. So therefore, we, we kind of piggyback on the negotiation of other countries and say what's fair for that group of, in the developed world is fair for us. How many people would support that? <laughs> well, that third approach is, is my bill, so thank you all of you who raised your hand. <laughs> and uh, President Trump did say uh, uh, not so many months ago, about half a year ago, he wanted to do a reference price bill, so we contacted him and said, oh, I'm, I'm ready to go, let's partner Merkley and Trump, like this. <laughs> and, Never uh, say that again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Delete that from the recording. Uh, so um, uh, the president, two days later, after he announced this, met with a group of pharmaceutical CEOs. Uh, and within a week, uh, he had abandoned his reference plan for a reference bill. But you know, if anything, Americans should get the best price because we invest more as taxpayers in the basic research for drug development than does any other country, the Canadians, the Japanese, the Australians, or the Europeans. And so um, we absolutely should be able to do this. We have 80% across the spectrum, independents, Republicans, Democrats, rural, urban. Nobody likes being the, the, the victims of this predatory pricing strategy that the drug companies use on Americans. So why haven't, if we have an issue that basically overwhelming support all through America and every political party, why haven't we gotten it done? Why? It's money in politics, plain and simple. And uh, the drug companies have many ways to influence things. They have a huge number of lobbyists. I have not fact-checked this, so I'm, I want to fact-check this, but I've heard that they have five lobbyists for every member of Congress. That's an incredible presence of uh, contacting our staff and contacting our members, plus they donate a lot of money. Plus, they do a lot of uh, public relations media advertising to change how Americans might think of this. Uh, plus, they do a lot of money in campaigns. And uh, if we're going to take on the basic issues facing America, we have to restore we the people governance, which means we have to take on gerrymandering, voter suppression, and dark money in campaigns. You know, Senator, uh, so I have not fact-checked this, but I was talking to my husband last weekend. Uh, we were watching uh, one of our streaming services, watching Hulu or, or something, and as the commercials were coming through, and maybe some of you have noticed this, there are so many drugs that are advertised, right, on television. When I, you know, I look at a magazine when I'm traveling, I'm seeing all these, all these advertisements for drugs for conditions that I've never heard of. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not common and that people don't suffer from them, but no one in my family, no friends, no whatever, but they've got enough money to spend on advertising 
drug after drug after drug after drug, it makes me wonder, well, how much money do they have if it's worth their while to sort of stream this to me who, for whom it's not at all relevant? So I'm really glad to hear you talk about just sort of the, the vast wealth and the size and of some of these Isn't companies. it the most bizarre thing to see butterflies and nice music and beautiful <laughs> vistas while they're saying, and the side effects are this will destroy your liver <laughs> and your lungs and every other organ in your body. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly right. Now back to your sitcom. Uh, I'm glad that we're talking about this too, and as we, uh, we're sitting um, right in front of our civic scholars from, um, from Park Rose High School, and I just want to sort of um, take a point of personal privilege here. As we talk about health insurance and health care, when I was younger, it sort of didn't mean anything to me because I was young and I was healthy, right? But I was an athlete, maybe I hurt, you know, I had sort of an ingrown toe from, you know, playing soccer, we had to get that, uh, that fixed. Um, I used to get ear infections sometimes, we had to get those taken care of. But health insurance, I always had it, so it was never really an issue for me until I went to college. And I still had health insurance, but it only covered me in Oregon, Senator. So when I got an ear infection in college, I had to run off and go to the doctor, and they wanted to charge me a whole $200. Now, that's now, I realize, not very much money, but I was outraged. And I called my parents and said, they're trying to cheat me. They think I'm a stupid college student. This is ridiculous. I'm, I'm you know, and then the, the prescription they wrote for me was another $200. I can't afford this. I'm not getting it. Luckily, though, my mother said, I'll send you the money. It's okay. Get what you need. But for young people, just as it is for older people, health insurance and the cost of health care and drugs is super important. Um, so I just wanted to sort of mention that as we're talking about these things. They have to do with you too, even if you don't quite know it yet. Well, in this uh, surprise medical billing, which is kind of uh, out uh, billing that happens when you're not in your normal list of uh, folks covered by your insurance, is a bill I think we have a chance of passing in the U.S. Senate and the House. I sure hope we can, but I also think personally our system is so complicated. It's so stressful. You get, you get coverage through your, your uh, work, but then they decide they can't cover your children. So how do you sign your children up? Or they decide they can't cover your spouse. So how do you get your health insurance for your spouse? And then you lose your job and you're going to sign up for Medicaid, but the income forms are extensive and then you earn a little more. So now you're off Medicaid, how to get back on private mm -hmm. insurance. Uh, we have veterans insurance, we have workplace insurance, workers' compensation. Uh, at a minimum, I believe we have to give everyone the opportunity to choose a Medicare-style plan that they can carry with them the rest of their life and quit worrying about their health care insurance. Everyone? Everyone. And I did put a little caveat on that. I said give everyone the opportunity to mm -hmm. choose. Mm -hmm. uh, I do not think you can say to Americans that if you like what you have, you, you have to be bumped, bumped out of it. I, th I think we've, we learned that uh, significantly back in 2009, 2010. But I was asked this by a business association, and it was, you know, it was a little bit of a hostile question about promoting a public option, a choice, mm -hmm. Medicare choice for all. And I asked the question, mm -hmm. so how many people here in the community in the business community, how many of you have SAFE uh, as your workers' comp insurer? And at least two-thirds, maybe, maybe three-fourths of the people raise their hands. Well, what is SAFE? SAFE is a public option. Right. It is a public option developed by the business community and the political community to provide less expensive workers' comp. It cut the price in Oregon in half of workers' comp insurance. It was adopted by Rhode Island. It cut the price in half in Rhode Island. Providing a public competitor is a powerful force that could reduce the cost. And if you can carry, if you sign up for it and have the option of carrying it with you the rest of your, your life, your, the complexity and stress of health care and health insurance has been dramatically reduced. Thank you, Senator. So I'll keep fighting for that. <laughs> I know I've got someone doing time checks for me. I think I'm still doing all right. Okay. Uh, there's a few more things I want to get to. So, um, Senator, one of the things that is a, is a key issue for me uh, and for the people uh, that my organization serves, and I know for that matter for my friends and neighbors, uh, is the issue of justice and expanding justice uh, in our communities, in our state, and across the country. Um, I know that you're up on this issue, so I want to talk to you about it a little bit. And it has to do with um, a, a Portlander, uh, a black uh, man named Michael Fesser. Um, West Lynn, Multnomah County DA, uh, Portland Police, 
Um, many of us have seen these headlines um, well covered in the Oregonian uh, and the Portland Mercury uh, OPB and, and other places. Um, but I just want to just set this, the context a little bit. Um, it is that there was a, a man by the name of Michael Fesser who uh, complained to his employer, um, a local Portland uh, towing company, that he was being uh, abused, treated poorly um, be because of his race. People were calling him uh, racial slurs. Um, and treating him very badly uh, at, at the work site on a, on a fairly regular basis. He complained to his boss about that um, and asked his boss to do something. His boss did nothing. He complained to his boss about that. His boss did nothing. And as he prepared to sort of do something about it, take it out, out, uh, elsewhere, um, his boss reached out to law enforcement um, in West Lynn and said, hey, I got this guy who's complaining. I'd like you to do something about it. And the West Lynn Police Department uh, then began to uh, sort of create a phony investigation, uh, trump up charges against this man because he was complaining about being discriminated against on the job. They unlawfully arrested him, uh, deprived him of his liberty, handcuffed him, put him in a police car, took him to the police station, uh, and then charged him with completely trumped up and false charges that were then brought to, um, uh, to, to, to Portland. Uh, so the Portland police were involved in this, um, the Multnomah County DA was involved in this, uh, and they brought him uh, up on charges. Uh, at, at one point, um, charges were kicked, um, then again they were brought before a grand jury and, and charges were again being brought against this man. This all started because he complained to his employer. The employer thought, how dare this man have the audacity to say that we don't have the right to call him a nigga. And I use that word in that way because I want you to feel it in your chest. Because that's what he felt in his workplace as he did his job. And when he said, no, that's not okay, the people he worked for decided, yeah, it's okay, and we're gonna do it again and again and again, and there's nothing you can do about it, and we're gonna use our power and our friends and our cronies to show you that we can do whatever we want to you whenever we get ready. And West Lynn police said, yep, sure can, we're all about that. Some important police, eh, how much do they know? We don't yet know, hopefully there'll be an investigation so we can get into the heart of it. But folks didn't really do the checks and balances in the, that they should have done to make sure that this man's civil rights could not be abused in the way that they were, right? He was failed again and again by our justice system. And I was delighted to see that you and other members of our congressional delegation stepped up and said, whoa, now that we have heard as much as we have heard, there needs to be an investigation. We need to go further and U.S. Attorney needs to step into this. But I would like to hear a little bit more from you because you have never been shy at least in my experience, about talking about justice, about talking about what's right, about standing up when you see something wrong, even if it may be unpopular. You're not one of those folks who says, well, we have to be careful. We're not quite sure what happened here, when in fact, you know, we have to believe our eyes. You know, uh, growing up, uh, I heard in, in education, uh, school, public school, a lot of discussion about values that we have in, in America. And one of those values was equal justice under law. And one of those justice values was opportunity for, for all, uh, equality. And these are powerful concepts, but we have fallen short uh, throughout our history. And I do believe, as Martin Luther King pointed out, that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice, that we have come a long ways in our 200 plus years but we keep realizing that it's not just an affair of the law, it's also an affair of the heart. How do people behave? So we've got to work both on the law part and the heart part. And on the, the law part, when we see something horrific like this, uh, racially motivated uh, misuse of law enforcement, well, we need to take it on. There needs to be a full investigation. That's what Senator Wyden and I and uh, Earl Blumenauer uh, called for. Uh, we need to think about how police training can, can help ad address that. And, and I'll defer to the m better experts on, on law and justice to the different programs. But also I think we need to think about the heart part. And, and what do I mean by that? I mean that, well, let me tell you a story. When I was first an intern for Senator Hatfield, I was the last arriving intern, so I was assigned to come in an hour early and open all the mail and of course that meant physically opening mail, <laughs> and um, sorted into four stacks for the legislative correspondents who would respond that day to every, every letter. And so I'm there, I'm opening these, these letters, and I'm hearing things I have never heard before. I'm reading people attacking others and telling Senator Hatfield about it because they're upset with the Catholics, and they're upset with the Jehovah's Witness, and they're upset with the Seventh-day Adventists, and they're upset with the Jewish community, and they're upset with the Mormon community. 
and they're upset with African Americans, they're upset with Latino Americans. And I was just stunned by the amount of hidden prejudices that was embodied in that, that mail coming to uh, Senator Hatfield. And uh, it made me aware uh, that uh, you may be in a community where people are all pretty progressive and, and treating each other pretty nicely, but there's a lot of hidden discrimination and racism. And uh, I must say that a lot of this hidden racism has been brought to the surface because of the leadership in the Oval Office. A campaign based on division, attacking almost every group in America, Haitian Americans, African Americans, Latino Americans, Muslim Americans, list goes on and on, attacking immigrants, and doing so in ways that encourages others to join in in that division. So when we hear any public official or any leader uh, putting out divisive message, we have to say we are going to stand with our brothers and sisters in the community. If it's an attack on our, our Muslim brothers and sisters, then let's go and meet with them and let's stand with them and say, no, not here. We're all Americans together and we're going to make this country more beautiful, more successful, more prosperous nation as Americans united. Senator, I do want to thank you and Senator Wyden and Congressman Blumenauer um, for stepping forward and calling for a further investigation. Um, as someone who runs a civil rights and social justice organization, often it falls on my shoulders to raise a flag, to raise a hand, to make the call, to write the letter. And the three of you were right there, you were right on top of it, and that, uh, it, it means a lot. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, it's time for a broadcast reminder. Uh, for our radio, <coughs> excuse me, for our radio audience, this is the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum coming to you from EcoTrust Building in Northwest Portland. I'm Nikin Gay Harmon Johnson here with U.S. Senator Jeff Merkley. Uh, while we're on the topic of justice and maybe a bit about corruption, um, I want to ask you about our national dis institutions. Um, we see that our courts are being stacked uh, with some folks who may be unqualified in, in, in my um, considered opinion. Um, we see that sort of every day there are people who are hacking away uh, against our institutions that we have thought for a long time, I think, to be um, un unassailable. And many of the people uh, on perhaps the other side of the aisle from you um, are sort of sitting idly by while this happens. Um, will you talk a little bit about you know, what that looks like, uh, what that means, and, and maybe what you're doing to try to stand up um, against the diminution of our democracy? Well, I feel like all of our major institutions are, are in trouble. But let me start with the, the one I'm in, this, the Senate. Uh, the Senate's had two dramatic changes in how it has operated uh, in my lifetime. One is back when I was an intern for Senator Hatfield and worked for Congress in the 1980s. Uh, a senator could put any issue on the floor of the Senate as an amendment or as, or as a bill and say, we need to debate this, we need to vote on it, and there was accountability to the American people. So if, if you felt you wanted more money for housing, you could put that on the floor. If you felt you needed a tax break to help some group out in America, you could put it on the floor. I mean, it's like, that is a very powerful role for a senator to have, but it's also accountability because people have to vote, senators have to vote and take positions. Uh, that ability to do an issue on the floor, it's completely gone. I think about how just 10 years ago I was able to put on the floor of the Senate an end to the war in Afghanistan and make people vote on it. And lo and behold, John McCain was not very happy with me. Uh, and, um, uh, but, but we won with these Democrats and Republicans voting together, said to President Obama, accelerate the plans to end the, end the war. You cannot do that today. Last year, we had just about two dozen amendments on the floor of the Senate, and most of them were negotiated beforehand, so kind of unanimous consent or, or overwhelming support. Uh, are you kidding me? The, the Senate used to do that many amendments in the course of a day and a half. I mean, uh, so that's a real problem. The second is a soup use of the Senate having to operate the supermajority. Now, our founders were wary of a supermajority. Uh, Madison said, do not bend the will of the majority to the will of the minority. You undermine the very premises of democratic governance. And Hamilton, with more eloquent language, said the, the fruit of a supermajority will be things like um, uh, tedious delays and contemptuous compromises of the public good. Uh, and that's kind of what we see. And think about this. Because of the way the Senate's constructed, with some people representing just a very few individuals in very low populous states, 
and then a few representing states like California, Florida, or New York that have a lot of people, it's not equal, anything close to equal representation. And if you have a supermajority, you can get a lobby like the pharmaceutical lobby, and they only hold individuals to prevent a bill from advancing. Uh, so uh, it's very problematic. It's why I'm arguing uh, that we have to go back to being a simple majority on virtually everything we vote on rather than being a supermajority on those votes. It's the only way we're going to take on the issues facing America. And, uh, so that's the Senate, but then we could turn to the other institutions. I, I won't spend time on the presidency. Uh, because it's, it's, it's values, it's conduct, it's everything He doesn't, why you should see. you? <laughs> and the citizens do have a power to change that a few months from now if they seize that opportunity. <laughs> I'm really worried about the role of, of our courts. Uh, in the time I've been in the Senate, we had some, some new lows. One was the theft of a Supreme Court seat, the first time a seat that there has not been a debate and a vote on a nominee from a president in American history. And um, that was when uh, Merrick was nominated and he was never debated and voted on. Deliberately to push that into the next administration with hopes that it would be filled by somebody from the far right. If you look at the decisions of the last few years, we have over 75-4 decisions for the powerful over the people. The Supreme Court has deeply undermine the very we the people vision of our nature. They have become the super legislators, which is why the fight over who is, sits on the Supreme Court has become so fierce. It is why the seat was stolen. And the main issue it was stolen over was the issue of Citizens United, mm -hmm. because they didn't know where Merrick would stand on potentially shutting down and reversing a 5-4 support for unlimited funds uh, in campaigns and the possibility of reversing that. Now our, our founders uh, worried about this issue of concentrated power. And it's a, it's a more complex story than I might present, but Jefferson said that the only way you maintain laws that reflect the will of the people is have highly distributed power. He called it equal voice, not just an equal vote, but an equal voice. And what is Citizens United? That's giving the wealthiest, most powerful individuals in America a voice that can drown out millions of other citizens. That's not right, it's not, and I know I mentioned it before, but this takes me right back to, to where I mentioned before. We have to reverse citizen, we have to pass the For the People Act, which would be the act, and Tom Udall and I, Tom Udall of New Mexico and I are the leads in the Senate on it. He's retiring, I'm going to be continuing to carry the, be the point person on this. We have to pass this bill to take on the gerrymandering, the voter suppression, and shine a light on the dark money. Okay, uh, we're going to open the floor to questions. Uh, we'd like to welcome our civic scholars to come to the mic and ask the first question. I think our microphone's on this side of the room, if you would please. And also, if you've written questions down, if you've got cards, raise them up and there'll be volunteers coming around to pick up those cards. And I think I'll be getting uh, questions from online as well. So everyone uh, watching or listening today is welcome to ask a question. Uh, it, please use your social media platform and hashtag Friday Forum. Again, that's hashtag Friday Forum, uh, so that we can find your question and I'll be able to read it um, from the stage here. To those of you who would like to ask a question, please identify yourself and ask one question, one question only, please, in 30 seconds or less. And we would ask that you make it a question rather than a comment or a statement. Um, so that we can get as many questions in as possible. I see that folks are getting ready over there on the microphone. I'm, I'm sorry, what? And when our civic scholar civic is scholar. ready, please let me know and we'll go forward. Uh, um, or whatever. In yes. The, in the meantime. Oh, she's first? Okay. Uh, Senator, while we wait sorry. for the civic scholar to get ready, let me ask you a quick question. Uh, if there is maybe one book that you have read uh, that you would uh, want all of your congressional colleagues to read, what might that be? I would love them to read a book written by an Oregonian, Nicholas Kristof and his wife, Cheryl Wu Dunn, that just came out called Tightrope. And uh, so uh, what he wrote about was going back to his home in Yamhill, Oregon, and talks about what happened to the kids on school bus number six. And essentially what happened was in the mid-70s, 
families that were progressing generation to generation started to go into a nosedive. A nosedive because the loss of living wage jobs followed by domestic violence, uh, an addiction, uh, and, and suicide, uh, and a drop in education completion. And it's, it's a portrayal of what has happened in much of America over the last four decades. And it's the underinvestment in those four foundations for thriving families, healthcare, housing, education, and good paying jobs. And how is it that our wealth has increased so much in these four decades and families have done so poorly? And so turning to uh, a story written by a, a, a prominent uh, Oregonian who um, uh, tells this story beautifully in partnership with his wife, uh, Tightrope. I'd encourage anyone else uh, to consider uh, reading it as well. Very good book. Thank you. We'll go to our first question. Please uh, tell us your name and ask your question. Uh, my name is Alexis Barber. I go to Park mm -hmm. Rose. I'm a senior. Um, our question from Park Rose is, will tuition go down for college if wages are going up? And when do you believe wages will be going up? Uh, so uh, uh, let me start with the tuition up part. Uh, and uh, tuition has gone up phenomenally. Uh, if you think about what's come down most in our society, it's the cost of a big screen television. You think about what's gone up most, it's tuition. And which means the vision of college has become uh, deeply damaged uh, for much of work in America. Uh, the, um, I had the fortune of my parents saying, um, we didn't go to college, uh, but we encourage you kids to think about it. Uh, and never came up that it would be unaffordable. Because at that time, you could work a summer job at minimum wage in, in the mid-70s, summer job at minimum wage, and pay tuition at a public Oregon university. Is that possible today? No not at all, not at all. And if we think about the question of opportunity for our individual children, that's a, that's a crime against the next generation. And if we think about our future economy without the benefit of what can be contributed be for all folks who can't afford college, uh, that's a crime. There's so much we can, so you asked, is tuition going to keep going up? At, at right now, it looks like the answer is yes, uh, unless the state in the public university and the federal government are able to insert a lot more resources. I do believe the federal government should act. I think we should enable everybody with a student loan, many of which are six, eight, or 10% to be able to refinance at the same low rate the banks get when they borrow from the federal government, which is one or 2%. <laughs> I think we have to greatly increase the, 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 the grants um, that, that go for low-income students to be able to afford college. I think in essence, we have to do what most developed countries have done, and that is to have the resources so that students can go to college debt-free and dive into their working life without a f big burden on their shoulders that handicaps them for decades after. Thank you and, for your question. And you asked when will wages start going up? Um, they've gone up a tiny little fraction uh, with the tightening of the labor market, but that will come and go. Uh, we, have to, we have to think about how to strengthen the ability of workers to organize through unions. We have to think out about much higher minimum wages. Uh, we have to think about how we design trade agreements so they don't undermine working America. I'm gonna re uh, read a question from the audience on a card that was brought to me. Uh, and Senator, this is great because it's one of the topics I didn't have a chance to get to, but the question uh, is, what opportunities do you see now in the Senate to combat carbon, carbon pollution, if any? Okay, well, <laughs> first of all, I'm gonna invite everyone to do a little exercise and, and hold your breath for three seconds. Ready? <coughs> Breathe in. <laughs> Exhale. <laughs> so that air you just had in your lungs, very different from when I was born. It doesn't have two or three percent more carbon. It doesn't have five or 10 percent more carbon. It has 33 percent more carbon. And it's going up dramatically. It's having a profound impact on our climate. Let's think in terms of its impact on people, on our ranchers and farmers who have less water because the snowpack melts earlier, 
or on fishermen who are having uh, challenges produced by that more warmer water and more acidic water in the ocean and so forth, of those who are affected by the forest fires that we have that are so much more prevalent. So it's a very, very big deal. It is the biggest challenge facing humanity. So the Senate should be right on top of it. But going back to that dark money issue, in 2014, the fossil fuel world said, we're going to use Citizens United. They invested over $100 million in Senate campaigns. Uh, and they proceeded uh, to switch the control of the Senate. And they have been really the, the masters of the Senate. And so we have a simple energy efficiency bill that Rob Portman of Ohio and Gene Shaheen from New Hampshire have been working on for years and years. And we are trying to get it on the floor right now as an amendment. And we went all week long, and no amendments were allowed by Mitch McConnell. I mean, bipartisan, simple energy efficiency. So I think that tells you what you need to know. Uh, and it's, it's that the Senate is not doing its, its job. Now, there are some, some smaller bills that we've had bipartisan work on. I've, I've worked with, with others uh, on this. Uh, I'm leading on a bill that provides ongoing subsidies to buy electric vehicles. Another bill uh, to be able to help make the transition to electric buses. And there's these smaller little bits you think would think those might be possible. If not a big comprehensive bill, little bits. But, but despite bipartisan support for these little bits, we can't get them passed. Uh, so it is going to take, take a, a, a complete leadership change in the Senate before we do anything significant, really significant, on climate. Thank you. I'm sorry to say. I will take our next question from the microphone, please. And if there are other questions on cards, if you'll bring them to me, I'd certainly appreciate it. Yes, uh, thank you, Senator Merkley, for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Johnny Engelhart Noel. I'm a Spanish interpreter, freelance. I was trained 30 years ago, and I'm doing healthcare because I enjoy it. But it's a safety issue and a healthcare issue where the interpreters in Oregon, some of the poor, poorest paid in the country, were making, in effect, around 12 to $15 an hour. Only 750 of us are qualified and certified, and I'm one of them. I was born and raised in Mexico. I identify as a Mexican, although I look like this. My question is, how can you help us to get money at the top? What we have is forming a union with interpreters, blaming the agencies, the agencies, but the money doesn't come to the top from the providers. In California, the providers uh, pay the agencies well and the interpreters well, and we can make a living wage. The point is that we have incompetent interpreters, and the public, the reason I'm doing this public is the public thinks we're making money because we dress nice, and, but we're not. We're making, in effect, about 12 to 15 an hour. And um, we really need help with, help with this. It's a safety issue. People are dying, and the, the, the hospitals lawyer up. I've, I've witnessed this, so thank you. And you're working for, you get paid directly by a healthcare organization? And most of us, uh, 4,000 or so, are freelance interpreters. And it's been stated many times that uh, people cleaning houses make more money. I mean, after we pay, we get about 26 an hour or something like that. But the agency is only, the wholesale price is about 38. So we need money at the top, like in California, yeah. where, you know, anyway. That's well, I'll, I'll say this. It's, a, yes. it's an issue I'm totally unfamiliar with. Oh, uh, I, I, uh, thank and you. so I can look into it. I'll introduce uh, uh, Carrie, who is here uh, somewhere. Yes, I, she gave me Carrie, her card. Carrie, back here, yeah. my, my field oh, oh, rep. Carrie. Let's oh, connect okay. the two of you. Okay, thank I'll you. I'll follow up, learn more about it, and, well, thank and you. Uh, try to get back to you. Because it's particular to Oregon, and Washington is almost as bad. But uh, we're struggling, but the problem is the money's not coming from the top. The lobbyists are modifying and thank, thank you. you for raising it and without thank good you. translators people can't get good health care who Sí señor, de acuerdo. Sí, sí, muy bien, gracias. <laughs> gracias, gracias. Gracias por la, la pregunta. Ah, a usted. Uh, how will we keep gerrymandering of districts from happening after the 2020 census redistricting? That's a question from the audience. So how do we keep gerrymandering from happening? So at the federal level, it is the for the people act. And what it sets up is a requirement for independent commissions. Uh, those have been fairly effective in greatly reducing the bias in a given state. And you can look to how Pennsylvania was, the districts were redrawn as an, an example. California is considered to have one of the best independent commission structures. There is a dilemma in this that, that I think is worth noting, and it makes you cringe, it makes me cringe, and that is this. The states that are most interested in doing it at the state level have tended to be states 
that are more blue states, and doing so has increased the bias in favor of the red team in the House of Representatives. And so that is, it's like doing the right thing locally uh, and is, feels right, uh, but it should really be done nationally so that every state has to have an independent commission and stop gerrymandering across the country. Thank you. It may feel like I'm speeding up a little bit because I am. I want to get as many questions in as possible, so we'll take another one from the microphone. And if there are questions from Twitter, um, if you could please bring those to me, that'd be great. Please go ahead. Hi, Brooke Persson, City Club member. With Super Tuesday happening last Tuesday, I was absolutely horrified that in watching the primaries that especially in California and Texas, you had people waiting in line for five, six hours. We have a national election coming up. We also have this COVID-19 virus. Oregon has an outstanding um, election procedure. In fact, my sister in California is jealous when I tell her what I do here in Oregon. So my question to you is, with listening to you talk, it sounds like there's nothing the Senate can do. So what can the Democratic Party do uh, starting in November to encourage people to vote by mail, do absentee ballots, do something? So if you're afraid to go to a place or you don't have six hours to vote, your vote still matters. So there is something the Senate can do, and it's to pass the For the People Act. But here's the challenge. You have uh, every, I, I hate to bring this up in repeatedly in partisan terms, I, uh, but I'm telling you the experience as I see it through my eyes. We have 47 sponsors that take, and the second main section of this act takes on voter suppression and intimidation. It basically takes the Oregon model and makes it the national model. It means everyone has the right to early vote. It means everybody has a paper ballot that can be recounted. It means that on election day you have to have equal staffing of precincts by population so that you don't have the manipulation of the, the precincts in order to have people waiting in line six hours or worse. It stops the purging of voting registration rolls done in a, in a, in a biased manner. Let's take the Oregon model and make it national, and then we will truly have a much better access to the ballot. And it takes voter, automatic voter registration and makes it national. Every Democrat in the US Senate, every independent has supported it. But the Republican leader pulled in his caucus and said, no one can sponsor this bill. Why? Because gerrymandering, voter suppression, and dark money are a source of power to the powerful and they don't want to let go of it. Uh, and we, but so we are going to have to have uh, not only a majority that are elected that will support taking this on, but then we need to vote by simple majority to pass it and say when it comes to defending the Constitution, the foundation of the Constitution, that can pass the Senate by simple majority. That's the only way we're going to implement it uh, nationally. That's what we have to do. Meanwhile, let's urge more states to take on early, early voting, vote by mail, paper ballots, and all the rest state by state. But we really need to do it nationally uh, in order to put our country back on track. Jeanette Shaw on Twitter, I see your question, and I'm going to pass it on to Carrie from uh, the Senator's staff uh, so they can perhaps get you an answer that way. But it's related to electric vehicles. I just wanted to give you a shout out. Thank you for watching, Jeanette, and thank Very you good. for contacting us via Twitter. Uh, we'll take our last question here in the room with the microphone. If you'd please t uh, tell us your name and ask your question. Uh, my name's <coughs> Kathy Moyd. Um, I'm wondering what the effect of the non-decision by the Supreme Court in the McGahn uh, subpoena case is going to have on the ability of the Senate to do oversight. Uh, thank you, Kathy. And uh, so uh, the Constitution involves these powerful checks and balances and envisions that the Congress can oversee the executive to make sure the executive is abiding by the law and is not up to a lot of mischief. To be able to exercise that check, you have to be able to get documents and witnesses. And the McGahn case is a case saying 
uh, does Congress have the power of subpoena to get a witness to compel them to testify? And the decision, and that was a circuit court that just made that decision? Did the Supreme Court just make the decision? No, it hasn't gone circuit. to the Supreme Court yet. Right, so it's going to go to the Supreme Court. Uh, but it's not there yet, but the lower court said, in fact, Congress doesn't have the power to, to use a subpoena to get documents or witnesses. That's completely outrageous. If that become, if the Supreme Court backs that up, it means that the executive can do whatever they want. It destroys the oversight of Congress. It destroys the very core check and, check and balance. Now, I'll tell you, there's another check and balance that just underwent an enormous uh, damage. And that is the power to hold a trial in the U.S. Senate on impeachment. We had, any time there is a trial in the Senate, the leader of the Senate should stand up and say, doesn't matter what party is in the House, doesn't matter what party is in the Oval Office, we have a responsibility to hold a trial, that means getting to the facts, and then make a decision over whether those facts merit expulsion from office, which is a bit of, ju of, of judgment over which there's not a clear standard, but, but uh, that's the exercise of the Senate. We did not get that speech from the majority leader. Instead, we got the speech, I'm going to work hand in fist with the defendant to uh, hold a short show trial. That's no trial at all. Everyone knows, no witnesses, no documents. It's not a trial. The Senate absolutely failed in its ultimate check and balance to do its job. Not because it didn't convict, but because it didn't hold a trial, a real trial. That's obviously acceptable. So, So as a response, I've drafted a rule that says any future impeachment trial, there will be full ability to get witnesses and documents and therefore get to the truth. With apologies to the folks with the microphone, that has to be our last question. We are out of time for the rest of today's conversation. Uh, so we'll have to pause at this point, Senator, but I'm not saying it's an end because I know you'll be back on this stage. I know you'll be back in the community and visiting the Urban League and with others of us uh, to continue talking about these important issues. Uh, but I want to thank the City Club uh, and all who made today's Friday Forum possible. Thank you to those of us in our radio and uh, TV and streaming audience uh, for joining us. Thank you to all who have joined us in the room today and most, partic most particularly our Park Rose High School uh, Civic Scholars. Yay. <laughs> Senator Merkley, thank, thank you, you so, so much. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful.